Let's begin, please. Good day, everyone. Um, let's put your uh, uh, group names. The class seems smaller after exam one. Uh, I hope you are not discouraged. Please do not be discouraged. Put it behind you. If you uh, have an issue with a question or an answer, just shoot us a message on Canvas, and uh, we'll work with you on clearing that up. Uh, don't be discouraged. Definitely, it's only one exam of uh, there's two more, and final is a big is going to be a big deal. You still have your homework, a lot of opportunity for extra credit and make up for things. So. Uh, don't dwell on it, but this is the style of the exam that you will see as we move forward. And not that I have to justify, but I'd like to share with you my philosophy on why I design, why I designed the class this way. Um, this is my eighth year installing, in, installing eighth year <laughs> teaching the course, um, say over 600, 500 students. Um, and I've tried different styles of doing the exam and the homework assignments. And in my opinion, I've concluded this is the best way, it's the least of all evils at least, um, that programming and big kind of problems are delegated to the homework assignments. And the exams are sort of lightweight, general understanding of the subject matter. Um, that's why there's no programming questions on the course because on the exams because programming changes the syntax changes there's new tools out there everywhere the programming ideas you know they stick i need to use a nonlinear solver or a linear solver whatever is going to be the most used method in 10 years you're just going to use that but at least you'll know that you need to use this kind of solver or that kind of solver so that's why i leave that for the homework assignments you have more time you can immerse yourself and for the exam it's more of a cursory understanding of the material more qualitative in nature um, so get used to these kinds of exams in my courses, at least in for exam two and the final exam. Um, this might have surprised you a little bit. Um, maybe that, you know, kind of didn't help you do very well. So hopefully on exam two, you'll do better as you prepare better uh, for it. All right. Today, I am going to start on perhaps one of my favorite topics uh, that I teach in numerical methods. There are two great two topics I really, really love when teaching numerical methods. This is one of them, least squares regression. And in the grand scheme of things, if you take a step back, in, in the first unit we learned how to solve algebraic equations. Those were linear and nonlinear. Single system, both linear and nonlinear. We have the tools, we're done with that. The second unit deals with data. You're given data points on a graph. We learned interpolation. And your colleague asked me a great question the other day, like, you know, what's the difference between interpolation and regression? Today, you're going to hear um, more about that difference. So interpolation has a place when dealing with discrete data. Regression is the next level in data analysis. And I would say it's far more realistic because it's dealing with data that is usually just chaotic and all over the place. Unlike the temperature and density distribution where you had a clear, well-defined physical process that is governed by a single parameter, which is the temperature. You change the temperature while fixing everything else. The density changes according to this clear, clean law, right? So you interpolate there. But in real life, processes that deal with biological systems, for example, um, diseases, um, uh, different physiological things, uh, structures, big, large systems, large engineering systems, it's difficult to get a response that is only based on a single variable. And usually, if you try to represent it with respect to a single variable, you're going to see a scatter of points, as I'll show you in the next, um, in the next couple of slides. All right, so I will begin the chapter with a story. Um, I always wanted to have like some theme music here and maybe like this guy from the movies, like uh, our chapter begins with a story, you know, maybe I'll hire someone to do that and kind of put it into a little movie, but you'll have to bear with my, with my voice and accent today. All right, so our voice begins with a story. Bones, anybody, maybe, okay, okay. 
Well, that show is like, it's, it's, it's an old timer show now, <laughs> right? So um, if you haven't seen this show, it's a gr if you love um, science and nerdy shows, just look up Bones. It's got like maybe 20 seasons or 15 seasons, something to binge on. Um, just don't eat a lot of ice cream while binging it because you're, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, you're going to consume a lot of ice cream. So anyway, so this is from a, an actual um, uh, TV show um, called Bones about this forensic anth anthropologist who is really, really, really smart um, uh, beyond recognition. And if you haven't seen the show, let's kind of tell you the story here. Um, a forensic anthropologist, which is an anthropologist dealing with bones and things kind of that they dig up, and plus add to that forensics where they have to, where there's foul play perhaps, and they need to determine perhaps cause of death or what kind of injuries, different things about the bones, okay? Um, and typically they're only dealing um, with bones. They're just looking at bones. So. Um, so our forensic anthropologist is called to inspect a burial site. All right, so this is a picture of the burial site. And this is a, a diagram of the human body. Interestingly enough, we kind of all look the same, uh, right? And so our bones are characterized. We all have like ulnas and femurs, etc. So um, as she's digging through the site, she found only a few bones left, including a femur, all right? Um, femurs are very important because they are very well co correlated with um, age and height of a person, etc. Just like when you cut a tree, you look at the rings, right? You can determine different thing things about the climate and the growth of the tree. Same thing for femurs. They're super important. And um, so this is the femur here, this bone for here in your leg. Um, and so she grabbed the femur, and now this is a very top secret investigation. And I cannot tell you about it because it's very top secret. But, but she is tasked with identifying the height of the individual and a few other things that are also top secret I cannot tell you about. But the only thing I could release to you today was that she only had the, that femur, and she wants to determine the height of the individual. And the only thing she knows is that the femur length is 42 centimeters. Okay, and because she's smart and she has like a good library in her, um, in her lab, she rushes to her anthropology book and she remembers that, well, there is data that correlates somehow, some crazy person one day decided to correlate um, femur length with height. Turns out that there's a very strong correlation between those two, so if you know the femur length, you could tell the height of the person and vice versa. All right, so she remembered those data, right? And then she went on and she plotted the data in Python, of course, of course in Python, right? And this is what she got. So she had them in a table, femur length on the first column, 40 centimeters, you know, they measured, they had a bunch of people, you know, come in, they measured their... They didn't cut their leg to measure the femur length, but they kind of estimated it, maybe took an x-ray and measured it, right? And they measured their height, and they put some data together. Um, you can visually look at the data, and you kind of see there's, there's like all over the place, right? In fact, for a femur length of 43 centimeters, there's two heights. If you look at the table, for 43, there's a, a person that's um, one, one meter 67 centimeters and another person that's one meter 64 centimeters. Because there's variation in reality and in life based on diet and all sorts of other things, right? And genetics and et cetera. The fact is that there is data, there is some trend in the data as the femur length increases, the height of the person increases, but locally, the data is clustered. Even at 45, there's two data points. At 44, there's two data points here for height, right? And, you know, she's interested in finding the height of the individual at 42 centimeters. So that's the line. All right. So now she looks at this data and she says, well, what the heck? I have these two data points or these two data points. Based on what we know, what is the height at 42 centimeters? Could we interpolate these two points? Sure, but what about these two points? What if there are 100 more points here, we just didn't collect them because we had a small sample? 
right? So what do you do? Do you interpolate all of them and average them? That sounds kind of random, right? So indeed, she tries to do linear interpolation. And if she were to interpolate the entire data like that, if she ordered it in this way, then this is the, what, what she would get, which is complete nonsense, right? That's completely ridiculous. Then she thinks, OK, maybe we do polynomial interpolation. So she's doing what I call the Monte Carlo approach. Let's just try different things randomly without thinking about it, right? So she does polynomial interpolation. In fact, it doesn't work. If you try to do polynomial for this case, it's going to crash. It's going to give you an error because the matrix is going to be non-invertible, et cetera. Anyway, so she got something crazy, whatever Python gave her at that time. And then she thinks about the data. She steps back and says, well, the data kind of has a trend, like I said. As the femur length increases, the height of the individual, as the femur length increases, the height of the individual um, does increase, right? Let's see how we can put that together. So there's clearly a trend, right? It's going in that direction. So she thinks about it and she's like, well, it's kind of sort of a straight line. It doesn't pass through the data, right? But it kind of captures the trend of the data. So now, I'll ask you this. Based on what you know so far about numerical methods, can you draw a straight line between more than two points? So for all we know about data fitting is interpolation, right? With two points, you can only draw a straight line. If you are given two points without any knowledge in between, you can only draw a straight line between two points. Between more than two points, you can draw a straight line. I mean, that's kind of one of the basic definitions, uh, right, from Euclid. So no, it's not possible to perform interpolation to a straight line with more than two data points, right? Yet... The straight line that Bones draw, drew had nothing to do with interpolation. Now, because she took numerical methods at the U, she decides to do what's called regression. And with regression, instead of drawing a line that passes through the data exactly or thinking about going, weaving a line through each data point, let's capture the trend of the data because the data is never known exactly in truth. It's only known in a statistical sense. So why, not, why try to capture it exactly? Because it's not exact anyway. So let's just capture the trend. That's what matters um, in reality. And indeed, she does regression analysis on this, on these data. And this is the line that she gets with regression analysis. Again, we're going to define all of those words. You might have seen them. I'm going to scrape off all the definitions you have in mind, and we'll redefine everything in this class, OK? And she gets this beautiful formula for these data. Y, which is person's height, equal x plus 123.2 units centimeter. x is the femur length. And then she simply plugs in 42 centimeters, look above, 42 centimeters in this formula in place of x. And she gets a height of 165.2 centimeters. That fits within the data, right? It's neither an interpolated value between these two points, nor in between. It's just somewhere, nor an average between the two points. It's somewhere here, right? It's like it's this point exactly. And it does fit on that line. It is in between those data points, OK? And that's regression. Regression, just the basic idea of regression is that you are trying to capture the trend of the data. All right, so now we're going to spend some time on untangling all of this and understanding what goes behind regression. Um, I'll go through the learning objectives first. Um, at the end, I don't know what happened to the font here. One second. Why is it so small? Maybe I have too many learning objectives. Hold on. One moment, please. OK. All right, so I'll go through these learning objectives one by one, if you'll allow me. You will be able to conduct full least squares regression analysis, both linear and nonlinear, 
and to arbitrary models. I'll teach you that. But in 1D, we're not going to do it in multiple dimensions. Um, we'll do it in, in one independent variable. The extension to multiple, depend, multiple variables is, is, not, is not that difficult. So given a set of observations in a model curve, we'll talk about that too, with unknown parameters, with least squares regression, you will find those parameters. Think of interpolation, we are finding the coefficients to fine tune that interpolant to go through the data. Same thing with regression. We're going to come up with a model formula, say this is AX plus B, or A, A, A cosine X plus B sine X, and find A and B, right? Except now, the curve is not going to go through the data points exactly because this is not interpolation. Um, and then you'll find the parameters such that they minimize the square of the error between the model and observations. Blah, a lot of stuff. Okay. You'll define linear regression. You'll define least squares regression. You'll formulate the governing equations for linear regression with arbitrary basis functions. Remember the discussion on basis functions with interpolation because I need it here. It is super powerful. Um, using least squares derivation, you define and compute the mean standard deviation and standard error. I will change your understanding of mean standard deviation and if you've seen standard error, you'll see it differently in this class. I promise you that. You'll define and compute the coefficient of determination, R squared, and it's lowercase r, not capital R for regression. It has a different meaning than outside regression analysis. Um, you'll visually identify which data set has higher standard deviation than another. You'll visually identify if a set of data, uh, from a set of data, if regression will have a high correlation or high R squared value or not. It's good to have R, high R squared value. You've probably all done some of that, like in Python and in, in Excel, when you put a trend line, it gives you an R squared of 0 0.9. You're like, yes, this is good. So we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a way to immediately tell if your regression is going to get you a high R, R squared value or not, just visually, by looking at the data. Um, you'll create code in Python for linear regression, both your own code, because we will see this will all result in a linear system of equations. That's why we learned that first. It's like everywhere. And you will also learn built-in tools in Python. So you'll do both, okay? And both are powerful. Um, you'll define what we call the normal equations, and you will use the linear version of the normal equations and the transpose method to, f this is the most beautiful thing in linear regression after you, we learn the hard and tedious way of doing it. I'll show you a little trick to come up with the governing equations in like one line, okay? One line uh, analytically or in code. Then you'll formulate the equations for nonlinear regression and solve them with Newton's method that's F solve. And finally, we will learn how to curve convert some nonlinear models for these curves, like remember e to the alpha x or things like that, a to the alpha x, can convert some of those into linear models. Because linear, we're, we're going to mean something specific when we say linear regression. It's not going to mean regression to a straight line. Okay? It just means that the system of equations that, we, that governs the coefficients is linear. Okay. So let's um, get into some of the math and deeper understanding of what's going on. Um, just out of curiosity, who has seen regression in a different context outside my, my courses? I didn't get that. Could you try? I'm not talking to you, Siri. <laughs> OK. Did you see it in the stats last semester? OK, how do you feel about regression? You've, did you see it in high school at all? OK. Um, okay, but you, have you done a trend line? Do you know what that means? Like, okay, okay, great. This is great because seeing it again is going to reinforce um, the concepts that you've learned, and you'll actually know more now than you did before. Okay, so here's the basic idea of regression: you are given some input data, x and y data, and you would like to draw a model curve between those data. Forget interpolation. Once you see data like this, you can't interpolate here. You, you will have, you're going to have some weird um, polynomial interpolant. It might, not, it might oscillate a lot. Forget about interpolation. Whenever you see data scattered like this, always think about regression. Then your objective is to capture the trend. Okay? And you can draw this 
with a large, with your with your hand, you could say, you know what, I could probably fit a quadratic over here because look, it kind of looks like a parabola, kind of going between the data. It doesn't have to go through each and every point of the data. Okay, remember that. That's the critical difference between regression and interpolation. All right, fit a, we our objective would be to fit a model curve that captures the trend of the data. Now, first, I'm going to teach you how to drive the car, and then teach you what goes under the hood. So we're going to first do basic regression in Python, all right? And you know, open up your laptop. But believe it or not, you already have the tools to do it. Remember polyfit when I told you about the degree of the polynomial? When we were doing interpolation, the degree of the polynomial, if you had n plus 1 points, I told you put exactly n for the degree of the polynomial. Anything other than n becomes regression. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to take the femur and height data, excuse me, and we're going to use polyfit and do regression to a straight line. In that case, okay, in that case, our degree for the polynomial is 1. Even if you have 1,000 data points, you're, doing, you're, not pass, you're not going through each and every data point. You're drawing a straight line that goes somewhere in between those points. It's going to do a regression. Okay, we'll, later, we're going to dig deeper to understand mathematically what that means. But I want you to at least know how to use the tool now. Okay? So polyfit, just like we did with interpolation, the only thing that's different now, so you're going to give it xi and yi data. The only difference now is that you're going to use something different for degree. If you use degree equal 1, you are fitting a straight line on those data. So a naught plus a1x. This is what we're going to do right now. If you do degree equal 2, you're putting a quadratic. If you do degree equal 3, you're putting a cubic, a cubic and so on. Regardless of the number of data points. If you had 1,000 data points, you can do 3, you could do 2, you could do 4. It will do regression for you automatically. All right? So go ahead and download regression activity 1, height, femur, with gaps from um, the regression module in Canvas. Go on Canvas, go to the modules, go to regression module. There's the first notebook over there. Download it, open it, load it up, and we'll work on it together. OK? It's called regression activity one. And I get it, we're going to do this blindly now without understanding what's going on under the hood, but that's okay because you are going to understand what goes on behind the scenes. But I just want you to know the tool and how to use it. All right, so let's see. This is the notebook with gaps, with the gaps. And this is great because you already did polyfit and you're doing it on your homework assignment now. So. It's a, it's, a, it's a utility, it's a tool that you already know how to use. All we're doing is changing the meaning of degree for a moment. All right, give you a second to load it up. Are we good? All right. So these are the data points that I showed in the slides for the femur length as our independent variable or the x data, and for the height as the y data. And first, we get the boilerplate out of the way. So I have all of this kind of put in, matplotlib in line, the beautiful SVG stuff, NumPy, and then importing polyfit and polyval. Remember, polyfit does the interpolation or regression for you, gives you the coefficients of that model. And then polyval evaluates that model at the different data points. OK? So let's go ahead and evaluate this first cell. For the second cell, I put uh, the x data and the y data into two arrays. I call them xi and yi. Uh, from now on, that's the terminology I will use with regression. i for input. So these are your input data. And I will rename everything to x and y so that I'm clear on independent variable and dependent variable, OK? You can name it whatever you want. You could put height, femur length, whatever. I'm just going to do x, i, y, i, 
x referring as the independent variable on the x-axis, y is your response variable on the y-axis. All right, so first thing we do when data is at hand, we plot it to understand. And given that this is a, sc a scatter, you do, do not connect it with lines, okay? You don't, you don't do um, this hyphen here. It's going to look weird like this, okay? So you just do a scatter. This is actually further evidence that you should only do a scatter plot when you are, have experimental data like this or observational data. Okay? Are we in sync? Okay. All right, using polyfit. Now we can use NumPy's polyfit to perform regression in general. For regression to a straight line, all we have to do is set degree equal to one. So remember, polyfit, what does it take? And the, it takes the x data, the y data, and the degree of the polynomial. Okay? If degree is equal to number of points minus one, then that would be interpolation. Anything else is going to be a regression. Anything below n minus one is going to be a regression. So here we just need one, degree equal one, because we're fitting to a straight line, a naught plus a1x. So there will be two parameters that this polyfit is going to return. Those are going to be a0 and a1, the unknowns in that straight line. So here if I put xi and yi and degree equal 1, and I go ahead and print this, it returns two coefficients, two numbers. What are those two numbers? They are the slope and the intercept. Because we're doing this, we're regressing to a straight line. If we do de degree equal 2, which is not going to make much sense here, but degree equal 2, we would be fitting to a quadratic. So it will return three coefficients for us, a0 plus a, and a1 and a2, right? Let's stay with degree equal 1. So that gives us the coefficient. Now the equation for the straight line is a0x, this would be a0, plus b, right? Or a1. Uh, sorry, a1, sorry, a1x plus a0, sorry. Now, if you remember on my slides, this is the formula I had for regression. x plus 123.2, right? So that was a1, was almost 1, 1.004, and the intercept was 123.2. All right. So now we evaluate the height of the person if the femur length is 42. We're going to use polyval. So polyval takes the coefficients of a polynomial. We're going to put coefs here and the destination value at 42 centimeters. And it's going to give us a height of 165.4 centimeters for the person. Okay? So these numbers have meaning. How do you enforce that meaning in your head as you're typing? You say the words, you, 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 you word it. Okay? The height of the, of the person is 165.4 centimeters. All right. So then, according to our regression analysis, a person with a femur length of 42 centimeters is 123.4 centimeters tall. Okay. Now we can plot the regression line on top of the original data. Okay, so that will show you how the regression line looks with respect to the original data points. So I want to keep the original data points as a scatter, but the regression line is a continuous curve. So I can plot it over a wide range of values of the femur length, which is going to be a straight line. So I'll create a, I will need to create, I could create a link space, or I can just create, uh, I can just use the input data points, okay? So this first line here, okay, if I comment this, um, let's label legend. happening here. Jeez. Les bleu. <laughs> Sorry, typo. Okay, so that's the original data. Now I'm going to plot our regression line with xi as the independent variable, and I will do poly, polyval, right, coefs, and at all values of xi. There you go. So it took each value of xi and evaluated it using the regression formula. 
Does it make sense what I did here? I took my regression line through and evaluated it at all the input values, 40, 41, 43, 44, 45, and so on. And it's going to give a different value than the original data, of course, because this is not interpolation. This is regression. At 40, the regression line gave us a different height. At 43, it gave us a different height. At, uh, sorry, at, at 40, 41, gave us a different height. At 43, it gave us, there are two different heights in the input data, but it gave us a single one biased more towards that point. Okay? Now, you see that line is kind of somewhere in the middle between all of those data points. You might think it's a little closer to these points over here because there's more points on that side of the line than there are points below that line. right? So that's what regression is trying to do, trying to find the best way to describe on all of those data points with a single line, right? You, have, you could have a thousand points and just draw a single straight line between them. Okay, it's gonna fall in between somewhere. Now, could you extrapolate with this with regression? Of course, I mean, that's the point of it. You could extrapolate a little bit, right? If the, because this trend is gonna continue, right? It's not gonna, maybe suddenly it's gonna turn flat after a certain femur length, people you know, are not gonna get taller, but they're gonna have very long legs, I don't know, right? Or maybe if the femur length is, is shorter, then you know, is, is it gonna plateau? Then extrapolation would not be very useful in that case. But you can still extrapolate a little bit, unlike interpolation. Interpolation, no, no, okay? Regression, you can extrapolate a little bit, but don't go too far. That's it, you know how to do regression. Now, you still don't know what it means, right? But you know how to do it. You now can use PolyFit to do it. Uh, what tools have you been using to do regression so far? Calculator, Excel, Py Python, like what, what, what tools? PolyFit, you've been using PolyFit. Excel. Excel, okay. Pandas, anything with? CurveFit, Curve okay. Why, wh uh, why CurveFit? Okay, was that stats? I, I can't remember. Yeah, so there's a place for curve fit um, for sure, but it has its drawbacks. So we will learn curve fit when we do nonlinear regression and arbitrary models. Okay, but polyfit is your way to go whenever you want to do just a simple straight line regression. It can do interpolation and regression at the same time. Okay, all right, that's it. Let's go back to the slides now. I move this to my. Now, are we ready to go under the hood? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's just move the slide a little bit here. All right. So we're done with this. Now let's go under the hood and try to understand how least squares regression works. I will throw a definition at you. It will make sense probably at the end of the chapter, but I'm just going to put it out there for completion. And as you study later, you refer to this definition, please. Um, least squares regression is defined as given a set of observations and a model curve with unknown parameters. This is what you want to represent the data with. It could be a straight line, could be a sinusoidal line, could be whatever model you think is gonna represent the data best. And it has unknown parameters, alphas, betas, A's, and B's, A naught, A1, whatever. It has a bunch of unknown parameters our objective is to fine-tune the parameters, find those parameters, such that we are minimizing a certain error. Now, what is that error that we're minimizing? It's the sum of the squares of the error between the model curve and the observation. Okay, what does that mean? Let's see. It makes sense. All right, so I'm going to go back to this graph. All right. Now, this model curve doesn't go through the data points, right? It doesn't go through the blue points. It goes somewhere in between them. And these are the errors. For a given x value, you have an observation and a model prediction. For this x value, you have an observation, the blue dot, and a prediction from the model. The difference, this difference is an error. The sum of the squares of all of those errors 
or the Pythagorean norm of all of those errors is what we're trying to minimize here, is what regression tries to minimize. We will start with least re squares regression for a straight line. Once you do it for a straight line, it becomes obvious for any other model. All right, so I'll guide you step by step through this, and we'll do the math as we are going through. And I will take three data points because that's enough to break the connection to a straight line. You cannot connect a straight line between three data points unless they're aligned on the line. So these guys are not aligned on the straight on, on the line. And you're given these data as pairs, x1, y1, x2, y2, and x3, y3. Agreed? This is just the data given to you, and I will always call xi, yi as the input data. Now suppose we want to draw a model curve that is a straight line, and I call that curve A0 plus A1x. The unknowns now are A0 and A1. Because x is that free parameter, I'm going to use values for x to get a response. But what I don't know, I don't know the slope and the intercept of that straight line. So that's what I would like to find. Our objective is to find A0 and A1. But we can't right now because we don't have any conditions. What are the conditions to find A0 and A1? When we were doing interpolation, we drew it between the two data points. We said, evaluate the straight line at point one. That's the first equation. Evaluate the straight line at point two. That's your second equation. Two equations, two unknowns. You can solve for the parameters. Here, we don't even, the, the, the line doesn't pass through even any point in general. So really, we're kind of starting off. We don't even have any equation to start with. But here's how it works. We're going to say, OK, for each one of those x values, we will have a model value. For x1, our model value is f1. I'm going to call it f1 because f refers to the model. And this is the model value at point 1. And it's a1, x1 plus a0. Remember, a1 and a0 are unknown. We don't know them. We're trying to find those. x1 we know. And you know we don't know f1 yet because we're trying to find, well, our objective is to find a0 and a1 to get f1. But let's see what happens if we do this for a second. Okay, so that would be f1. Same thing for x2. It defines an f2 at the model curve. Notice the difference here. We have the data that's given to us in blue, and the red squares are the data predicted by the model, or the information predicted by the model. We don't know where that f is yet, but that's okay. So our objective is to find it. And we, as we go through the process, we'll figure out how to find that. And finally, for x3, we get another red square. And those are the model prediction at the input data. So the only thing we have are the input data, right? And so we're going to try to figure out how to find that curve based on the input data. So first thing we say, OK, we're going to evaluate the model at all of the input x values. All right, so I'm going to simplify this figure a little bit. I'm going to call, assign the y values here at the blue points and the f1, f2, f3 values at the red points. Remember, the red points are the model predictions. Now, the difference between the model prediction and the input value is an error. Because we're treating the input value as the truth. The model value is a prediction made by the model. And we know, it's, in general, it's not going to be on the input value. So there's going to be an error there. So at the first data point, we call that error E1, is the difference between F1 and Y1, that difference. At point 2, also we have an error E2. And at point 3, we have E3. OK, so we still have not solved the problem, but we're getting there. Because now I, I, I only need two equations to get those two unknowns. But now I have more equations than I need. So it's an undetermined system. But here's the idea. Let's find A0 and A1. So remember, A0 and A1 go into F1, F2, and F3, right? Let's find A0 and A1 such that the total error between Fi and Yi is a minimum. In other words, the total error of E1, E2, and E3 Somehow there's sum or there's sum of squares or whatever we define a total error, and that's kind of arbitrary definition, um, is a minimum. Now, a common measure of the total error, and the one that is consistently used in regression because 
It has a lot of advantages. It always going to find a minimum for you. Um, is the Pythagorean norm of the error. So in other words, the sum of the squares of the errors. So if you think of E1, E2, and E3 as the components of a three-dimensional vector, the size of that vector is square root of E1 squared plus E2 squared plus E3 squared. Or just we don't need that square root to define that total error. We're going to define it as E1 squared plus E2 squared plus E3 squared. Okay. Now here's the beauty of this. If you think about it, F1 and F2 and F3, each one of them has A1 and A0. But they are separate. E1 is its own thing, E2 is its own thing, E3 is its own thing. By combining them into one equation, into one term, S, that S only has A0 and A1. We've reduced three separate equations with two parameters into a single formula okay, that has both A0 and A1. Now, if you expand this a little bit, this is what it looks like. E1 is y1 minus f1, E2 is y2 minus f2, E3 is y3 minus f3 squared. But f1 is a1 x1 plus a0, f2, etc. right? So fi is a1 xi plus a0. So f1 is a1 x1 plus a0, and so on. So if you were to substitute that back, go ahead and fill in the blanks. So replace f1 with its value, replace f2 with its value, f3 with its value. Go ahead and write that down, please. I feel like I'm spending more time on that side of the, I'm gonna spend some more time on this side. <laughs> Just substitute the values of F1, F2, and F3 according to the model formula, right? I want to bring in A0 and A1 into this S, into this sum of the squares, okay? Sum of the squares of the error, <laughs> okay? You got, you got that? Perfect, okay. All right, so let's see what's the first term, the runs. Squared. Okay, second term. Correct. And remember, the A1 and A0 remain the same, only the X, Xi changes. Right, Max, you got an answer? Third term. Okay, correct. All right, so you're simply substituting this formula into F1. You put one here. You put two, you put three, right? So we've combined the errors, okay? See how we incorporated the model now into the error. We have one formula now. So we went, we went from three equations with two unknowns to one equation with two unknowns. We still haven't solved the problem. We, we need two equations for these two unknowns, okay? But we can have the recipe. Remember, I want to find A0 and A1 such that this s, or the sum of the squares of the error, is a minimum. When is a function a minimum? When its slope is zero. When is a two-dimensional function a minimum? So for 1D functions, f of x, f, when f prime of x equals zero, you get that x term, minimum or maximum, right? For two-dimensional functions, why is this two-dimensional? What are the two dimensions here? X1. Yes, it's A1 and A0. Because X1 and Y1 and X2 and Y2, they're numbers, they're given to you. This is a function of the two unknowns here are A0 and A1. So think of this as an error formula. For all the values of A0 and A1, if you were to plot this in 3D, it's going to be a crazy curve. It's going to have one point that's a minimum. And that minimum has a unique value for A0 and A1 that is going to minimize that total error. So that's what we're trying to find. In 2D, 
with A0 and A1, the conditions for an extremum, and it's going to be a minimum in this case, is that the derivative with respect to each variable is 0. So same way with in 1D, where you had f prime of x equals 0, here your two unknowns are A0 and A1. If the slope with respect to A0 is 0 and the slope with respect to A1 is 0, both of those conditions need to be met. Because that's going to be, if you think about the function in 3D space, it's going to be that dip. And at that dip, the slope is 0 in both directions for A0 and A1. Okay? So that's the condition for S to be a minimum. Now, why is this a minimum? I will not teach you this, but for re linear regression, if you do the square of the errors, this is always guaranteed to be a minimum. Because sometimes when this is zero, it could be a maximum. But for least squares regression, this is always guaranteed to be a minimum. Because we use the square of the error, there's like some crazy math behind this. But know that this is always an, an, a, a minimum. I, I have a little note here for those who might have an issue with this. It says, more accurately, these are the conditions for an extremum. A minimum is only guaranteed when the second derivative or the Hessian test applies. For regression, this is always true. Anyway, so for regression, these conditions always result in a minimum. Forget about anything else. You always have a minimum. Move on. Okay. So now we have our two equations. Right? ds by da0 equals 0 and ds by da1 equals 0. We have two unknowns, a0 and a1. We got it. Right? Go ahead and fill in the blanks. Differentiate. So a partial derivative, you hold everything else fixed and you differentiate with respect to that variable. So when you're differentiating with respect to a0, everything else is fixed. a1 and x and y. You're only changing A0. Only A0 is your unknown, OK? So just treat it as a one-dimensional derivative with respect to A0. So as if I'm asking you, differentiate this formula with respect to A0. Forget everything else. Differentiate with respect to A0. And then do the same with respect to A1, OK? Now remember the un prime is n u prime u n minus 1, like u derivative of u squared is 2u prime u. Yeah, so in 1D, when the slope, when you have a curve and, and the xy plane, right, you have an extremum, either maximum or minimum, when the slope is 0. In, multi, in two dimensions, in this case, a1 and a2 are the x and y axis, and z is the value of the error of s. Okay, so it's going to look like a curve like this. It's going to have like a, a it's going to slope down at the bottom, and the slope is going to be zero in both directions. So if you're moving in the a1 direction, the slope will be zero, and also moving in the a1 direction, the slope will be zero. For one dimension, you don't do a regression. There's no regression. It will be a constant, right? So then that was going to be the mean. <laughs> that would be the mean value. So, yeah. There's no equivalent for regression in like one, one D. There's no equivalent. So, so now remember, this is still a straight line. So when, when all is said and done, it's a 1D function. But S is a function of two unknowns, A0 and A1. But the model is only a function of X. So the model is 1D. But I, I think I know what, what you're thinking about. Forget about the model. Now you have just this formula for the error. The error depends on these two parameters, A0 and A1. So the error is a, it's a, two dim, it's a function of two dimensions, yeah. right? Yeah, we're just talking about S here, not the original model. Once we go back to the original model, it's a 1D curve for sure. It's a straight line, okay? And all the models we're going to use are going to be 1D now. But the errors, if we have more parameters, you have five parameter model, it's going to be five dimensional yeah. function. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Any takers on ds by da0? The various variables varying variously. <laughs> I remember you. Sarah, do you got, you got something? 
Uh, no, for dS by dA0. Yeah. So the question would be negative 2 times in parentheses huh? Okay, so let's hold on there. So what Sarah did, or the team did over there, they took the first term, differentiated with respect to A0. So first you have the square, right? And you're differentiating, you take that n value 2 to the outside, times the derivative of what's in the parentheses with respect to A0, which is minus 1, right? So you get minus 2 times everything in the parentheses. Same thing for the second term, same thing for the third term, right? Okay, what about ds by dA1? This one will be a little harder. You guys got it over there. <laughs> no? Okay, maybe I'll use... Uh, uh, Yes. Yeah, so I don't know if you can even see here. So I'm finding the derivative of y1 minus a1 x1 minus a0 squared. We're finding the derivative of this with respect to a1, right? So that's going to be, so this is like un prime prime with respect to a1 is going to be n u prime u n minus 1. In this case, n is 2, so I'm going to have a 2. What is the derivative of everything in here with respect to x1? Negative, yeah, with respect to a1, sorry, it's negative x1, right? Because you're different, you're holding everything else is constant except a1. What is multiplying a1? It's minus x1. So you get minus x1 times u, everything in parentheses, to the power n minus 1. So you get y1 minus a1 x1 minus a0 to the power 1. You, you need to know how to do this because this will be on the exam. Okay? No surprises there. All right. So this is what you will get. And then the same thing for term 2, the same thing for term 3. Okay. Let's now not worry about finding derivatives. Assume that you know how to do this. Now what you have is... Two equations with two unknowns, right? And they are what? Linear. They're linear in A0 and A1. There's no squares on any of the variables. There's no weird sines or cosines. It's just a system of two equations and two unknowns. Okay, so we clean it up a little bit. We combine a few terms together. We put all the unknowns on the left-hand side. Sorry, we put all the unknowns on the left-hand side, and we move everything to the right-hand side. Now, I did this for only three points, okay? So let's now do it for an arbitrary number of points. I wanted to kind of get you started with something that you can manage. Actually, with more data points, it's easier because you can use a summation sign. All right, so now we will repeat that same exercise, except now we have an arbitrary number of points, x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, dot, 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 xn, yn. n data points could be 1,000, a million, 7, 31, doesn't matter. Okay? Then we draw a model curve between those points, a0 plus a1x, same thing. Again, evaluate that model curve at the input data. You get f1, f2, f3, dot, 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 fn as your model predictions, and then define the error between each one of those da input data points and the model values, right? So it gives you E1, E2, E3, et cetera, all the way to En, right, that last point. Now you define the total error. In our previous example, we had E1 squared plus E2 squared plus E3 squared. Now you have E1 squared plus E2 all the way to En squared. But it's a recipe, not for disaster. It's a recipe. They're like all the same form because F1 and F2 and Fn, they all look the same. So you can write this whole thing as a summation. This is actually simpler because it's one term mathematically, not three terms or seven terms, right? Summation of Yi minus Fi squared. Now you substitute 
fi equal a1 xi plus a0. So you see the process. We define the model curve. We define the error. We substitute the model curve into the error, each term. So, so all you're doing is you're taking fi and putting it in here. And you actually have to just keep xi here, right? It's easier than the previous example. OK, so now that's our total error. The objective is to find A0 and A1 to minimize the error. And the error is minimum. It's still a two-dimensional uh, quantity. S is a function of A0 and A1. Those are the unknowns. So S is minimum when both of these conditions are, um, are met. The slopes with respect to A0 and A1 are met. Now I want you to redo this, but now keep the summation. You're only going to have one term with a summation in it, OK, in parentheses. So now do, do the derivative, OK? Do the derivative and show me what you get. Remember, xi and yi are constants. They're known, OK? In fact, these derivatives will be easier because you just have one term to do. You got it? <laughs> first one? Uh, All right, let's start with the first one. Uh huh. Summed over all points, right? So, however many points. What's the second one? This guy, right? Except now you have a summation. So you have summation of yi a1 xi squared. Then you will have summation 2 minus xi yi a1 xi minus a0. If you're still struggling with that derivative, forget it for a minute, but make sure you rework it after class or come to the office, come to the help sessions. You need to know how to do these derivatives because they're going to be everywhere. OK? All right. So this is exactly what you get. And it's actually cleaner over here. It's much cleaner than it was before. All right. Again, these are two equations with two unknowns. The summation does nothing except just adds more and more terms. Okay. So let's clean this up a little bit now. Uh, because I like to write the system of equations as matrix times unknowns equal right-hand side. Right. So I want to move everything that we know, which is the summation yi and summation xi yi, I want to try to move those, all of them to the right-hand side. And we can do this, then split the summation. So the minus 2 disappears because it cancels out with 0, right? So you get summation yi minus a1 summation xi minus summation a0 at the last term, right? So be careful about that one. And at the bottom, you have summation xi yi the product of xi and yi, and then a1, etc., etc. Now, notice what happens here. Summation a0 is actually a0 times summation of 1, n times, which is n. Okay? So be careful about that. Summation of a like constant parameter, okay, even if it's not i, you have to add it n times. OK, so summation A0, although you can take A0 out of the summation, because it doesn't have an index, but you still have A0 summation of 1 n times. So that is equal to n. Just be careful when you do that. That's always going to show up there in these kinds of models. 
Okay, so now go ahead and write this as a system, the system of linear equations in matrix form. So coefficient matrix, solution variable or are the unknowns, A0 and A1, and right hand side. Because once you know the matrix form, the coefficient matrix on the right-hand side, you can program this in Python and solve it. And we will demonstrate that we get the same answer that Polyfit gives us, right? So that there is sanity in what we're doing. And you can order the variables however you like. Maybe order them as A0 and A1. It shouldn't matter as long as you're consistent. Sorry, give me a second. Yep, I did order them as A0 and A1. Okay, let's see. Do we have any takers? Yes. So for my coefficient matrix, I have for, sum x i and then second row would be sum x i, sum x i squared, mm -hmm. and then I times a0 and a1 mm -hmm. equals sum yi, sum x i, and that's still sum x i. Beautiful. Okay. So we just put the coefficients of move everything to the move things that we know to the right hand side, which are some yi, some xi, yi, and keep the unknowns and their coefficients on the left-hand side, shown in red here, a0 and a1, and then just write this flat out into matrix form. n some xi, that's the first equation, times a0, a1 equals some yi, and the second equation. Now notice the, the interesting pattern in this. You have n some xi, some xi, some xi squared. That pattern we will demonstrate later that it will repeat as you increase the, um, the models. So as you increase the, the, the complexity of the model. And for this case, for simple regression to a straight line, the solution can be found analytically. You know, I'm just adding it here um, for, you know, again, if you're on an airplane and you wanna do a regression, and so you just kinda pull up your envelope and do this exact solution, right? And you would kind of get your xi, yi values and build your table of xi squared, xi, yi, add them up, and then compute the coefficients. This is exactly what we get, the same what Python, um, what Python gave us, okay? So now we will program this together as a system of linear equations. So we're going to go back to what chapter one, systems of linear equations. We're going to put now this matrix. And the right-hand side in Python, we're going to do lin algebra solve, find the coefficients, and do the plot, and then compare with polyfit and see that you know, it's a little bit more tedious doing it by hand, but it gives you more flexibility. Okay, so let's, let's Pythonify this. Um, grab your Python notebooks. Actually, um, before you grab them, I want to show you a few tricks. Okay? Um, so at... at Face value, you might be concerned about these summations, right? How am I going to do some xi? How are we going to do some xi squared, some xi, yi? You might think we could do a for loop, right, which is fair. Um, but it turns out that NumPy provides ab the ability to add up terms in an array. So if you have xi and yi as NumPy arrays, you can build the regression matrix with the following tools. N is simply the length of xi. So n is len xi. 
sum xi is simply np dot sum xi. Gives you some xi, right? Sum xi squared is numpy dot sum xi squared, right? That's what's so great about Python. And sum xi yi is np dot sum xi times yi. Okay? It's pretty neat. And then all we have to do now is put it in the matrix. So let's go ahead and switch to our, um, to our notebooks. Uh, all right. This is it. So here we want to regress the data to a straight line. And this is the formula. All right. So now we build the array. This is a simple two by two array. Just do it by hand. No need to complicate things. Just put it in the way we used to put in these simple systems of equations. So the first entry here is row by row. So we're going to do n. And for sum xi, mp dot sum of xi. Again here, np dot sum of xi. And finally, np dot sum of xi squared. It's as simple as that. And always print it out to see that it makes sense. Now, for the right-hand side, why don't you spend a minute to try to program it yourself? So, for the first entry is mp.sum yi, right? The second entry, again, mp.sum of xi times yi. Anybody stuck? Okay, so now we have the coefficient matrix on the right-hand side. What do we do with it? We solve it for the coefficients. Remember, linalgebra.solve. If there's a function that's going to last, stay with you for your lifetime, it's like the print statement in Python and linalgebra.solve, okay, and NumPy maybe. <laughs> okay, so for linalgebra.solve, we give it the coefficient matrix and the right-hand side, okay? Now, that is going to give a solution. What is contained in that solution? Don't lose track of what we're solving for. Yeah, it's going to contain A0 and A1. Now, they're going to be in a different order, right? Because we solved for A0 and A1. Polyfit was solving for A1, A0 in reverse order, but they're the same. So if you scroll back up to the solution from Polyfit, look at COFs. Remember Polyfit? stored its solution here. We had 1.0043, et cetera, and 123.2. This is exactly what we got here. Isn't it cool to do exactly what Python is trying to do behind the scenes, right? There's no mystery to it. Someone who created, the person who created that routine did it the way we are learning it, right? With like solve, et cetera. So maybe one day you're going to create another routine. So it's important to kind of learn even if there's a tool out there that does it for you, there's going to be eventually, as we will show in, the, in, this, in these lectures, a limitation to what Python can do. There's going to be some spots where you have to program everything by hand. OK, so now the variable sol contains A0 and A1 because that's the order we put the equations in, okay? A0 and A1. OK, so that's not the end of it. Now you, you need to build the model function. Right, so we got A0 and A1. Now we need a routine. Okay, what is the femur height at 42 centimeters? You could say you could type manually A0 times 42 plus A1, but you're using Python as a calculator. Use it as a programming tool. So what I suggest you do is you create a routine that builds that model for you and evaluates it whatever you want to evaluate. So you grab the coefficients from sol, our solution here, A0, this is A0, and this is A1. Just call them A0 and A1. And then construct a function for the regressed line. So our model is A0 plus A1, oops, A1 times x. 
right? So now you can evaluate your model wherever you want. At 42, you get 160, at 42 centimeters, you get 165.4 centimeters for the height of the person. Exactly what Polyval gave us up here. If you look at Polyval over here, 165.3896, right? 165.3896 and so on. And also you can plot the original data and the, your regression line. Just like we did with polyval. Sweet. They are, do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay, we're here. It's good, yeah. So the process is a little more tedious, right? Because we had to program the matrix, the coefficient matrix, the right hand side, solve it, get those coefficients, and build the model function, okay? You can use polyval given the two coefficients, you'd have to swap them because polyval takes A1, A0. Anyway, but it's a little more tedious, right? But it gives us the, exactly the same thing. Now, because you're engineers, you need to dig behind your, even data scientists might not necessarily know the details. They know, oh, I just use polyfit and polyval or curve fit, right? So you are expected to know more. And that's why we're digging um, um, under the hood to know what's going on behind the scenes, okay? All right, um, how about we take well, I don't have much time left. Um, let me see what I'm covering next. Okay. All right. So let me close with this, and um, I'll get you get started on the discussion. Uh, if it's okay, we can, we let's not take a break today. Let me just get started on the discussion for next week, and I'll let you go a little earlier. Okay. Okay. So now, these equations that we obtained, they are by definition called the normal equations. Okay, not because they're normal, there's nothing normal about them. They're weird and complicated, they're gonna get very, very complicated. But the normal equations are the equations, linear or nonlinear, that govern the parameters of a least squares regression. Now you understand, what is least squares? It's minimizing the sum of the squares of the error. That's why we use least squares regression. Least means the minimum squares, squares of the error. So when you hear least squares regression, you are minimizing the square of the error between the model prediction and the data. Now it's kind of starting to make more sense, right? After we saw the math. The governing equations for the parameters of the model whether these equations are linear or nonlinear, we're going to get to a point where we're going to do nonlinear regression. These are called the normal equations. Okay, they're called the normal equations. In other words, the normal equations are obtained by setting equal to zero the partial derivatives of the sum of squared errors to obtain the least squares equations. Okay, so when you hear least squares regression, it means we are fitting a curve that minimizes the squares of the error between all the points, or essentially the sum of all the squares. That's why you hear least squares regression. Are there other types of regression? Yes, sure. This is the most popular, okay? That's what we mean by least squares. The normal equations are the equations that govern the model that we're trying to use to explain the data, okay, and fit the data. So you perhaps had a statistical perspective on regression with like estimators and biases and whatever. This is more mechanistic and more statistical one is based in math, but this is more mathy. It's like, yeah, you know, we have a curve. I want to minimize the error. Whatever you mean by the error, whatever you mean by an estimator, I don't care. It's just a curve that minimizes the error. However you want to interpret it, this is how it's done. Whatever the interpretation is, whatever you're a frequentist or Bayesian interpreter, it doesn't matter. This is the mechanism to do it, okay? And it works. Okay. So now we need to get into error analysis, and uh, I will defer that for next week so that we have a good continuous discussion, okay? Thank you. I will see you, not next week, on Thursday. I'll see you on Thursday.